right, welcome to another School Sessions podcast. This is Dan Hank, and today my host is uh, Ryan C. Thomas. Is that correct? Yep, Ryan C. Thomas. Okay, and uh, let's talk a little bit about you, Ryan. So what are you up to? What have you done so far? Uh, we're talking book-wise, I assume, right? Um, I well, guess I- if you're doing crazy, like, assassin expeditions or <laughs> something, you know. I can't talk ears. about this. Can't talk about the assassin stuff just yet and waiting for clearance. Um, oh, I understand. I guess, uh, I guess primarily uh, I'm known for the summer I died is kind of my, my big quote unquote famous novel. Um, when did that come out? That came out in 2006. It's been a while. Okay. You know, it's such a, it, that's been such a weird ride because the first 10 years it was out, Nobody read it. Nobody cared. <laughs> then about uh it was that Undiscover Gem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. And then I think really what happened was uh somebody on uh bloodydisgusting.com, they read it and they did an article on it, and then it was like the next day I'm getting calls from like the producers of The Walking Dead and stuff like That's awesome. Yeah. Film options and that's it kind of blew up from there. So it's weird how that happens, like that one little like turn of events. Yeah. Like, yep. like Rob Zombie was played on Beef Somebody, and suddenly he's like the next big thing. You know, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Guns and Roses, like their album came out for a year, nobody gave a fuck. And then yes. and then their label paid MPV to play it one time at midnight, and they played it one time, it was so highly requested they blew up. Yep. Yeah, it's a, it, I tell people that too. I go, don't don't be a writer because you think it's going to be fame and money. Like the people who even get one through, I've got, you know, 15 books, or whatever. I was like lucky enough to get one through. And it's like, that was almost just kind of like a fluke, you know, I'm, and I'm happy people like it, you know, I'm, I'm right. proud of them. But like, yeah, like don't go into it thinking there's fame and money because there's not like, hopefully you get one through, you know, the, yeah. if you can get one out to the masses and it gets some recognition, great. You've done it in, in my book success, you know? So well, do your job is only half the work. Like it's marketing, it's luck of the oh, draw, yeah. it's like everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um so it took it took a while for that to take off, and once that took off, it has been kind of a steamroller ever since. Yeah, yeah. It, once it took off, I think once the um when it got that first film option and Bill Mosley had signed an his agent signed an LOI, which is a letter of intent to play the villain in the book. Uh, awesome. Bill Mosley is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I actually met him and like super nice guy, greatest guy. Um, and and uh, what was I going to say here? I actually yeah. had him. He wrote his signature on my leg and I had it tattooed. So no, oh, nice. signature on my leg. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Weirdly, I had met him. Um, was right around. I think the book had been out for a couple of years, but it was before the movie option. And I was at some convention. He was there. And I got stuck in the elevator with him and my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time. And he remembered my wife, remember my wife's name. So he was talking to her. <laughs> talking, and he was a super nice guy. And uh, so that was kind of when they when they did the film option, uh, and they said, Well, who who would you want to be skinny man? And I said, I think Bill Mosley would be great. And they went, Great, we're gonna get Bill Mosley. And so they got his agent to sign the LOI. Nothing, you know, it never happened, which was unfortunate, but that's the movie business, you know, so. Yeah, I'm sure that happens all the time. Oh, uh, all the time. Yeah, yeah. I really like the uh, the short story you wrote for my anthology. Like, it, Thank it's you. pretty much like a Outer Limits, sort of like Twilight Zone, Tales from the Crypt. Like, it has that feel it, to it. Yeah, I was definitely going for a little bit of a creep show, Tales from the Crypt, sort of 80. You know, I'm a child of the 80s. I'm a Gen X guy. Um, I grew up with Creep Show and Tales from the Crypt and Twilight Zone marathons on TV. And I just love and Richard Matheson type stuff. I just love those kind of like Yeah, creep- Richard Matheson is a man. He he's written so much yeah. good stuff. And I think people don't even realize, you know, like Sir Rebecca's and Hell Owls yeah. and I Am Legend. And yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, his 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 long form stuff is so good. And then his his short stories are like, because his long form stuff is like, um, it's a little more subtle, you know, but his short story work is so creature feature-esque right. a lot of the time. 
and, and I love that, you know. Well, I think he's so good at telling a story. Like I read, uh, like it's more of a novel than a novel, but it's about like a uh, like a cowboy in the old west, and you know. But he had my interest the whole time, even though that's not really the genre that I'm into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's he's just great across the board. I always recommend him to people, and it's it's kind of sad, maybe a little bit, that a lot of people, younger kids today, don't know who he is. You know, yeah. and I'll, like oh, you got to read Hell House, and you got to read. I mean, I am legend. They probably know because of the Will Smith movie, but I'm like, go back and watch all these old. Which was not a faithful adaptation no. at all. No, the, the best one. So, yeah, yeah. The, I think the best one is the Vincent Price one. The okay. And on Earth, it's called. I think right, that's right. about as faithful as it's been to that that book. So, oh, I didn't think the Charlton Heston one was too bad. I mean, it's better than I think the recent version. Yeah. I agree. The, the the Charlton Heston one is a pretty good one. But that's the uh, Omega Man, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I thought that, like, what I really like about that story is, like, he says, I am legend because he's the last human being alive, and they execute him because he's a mass murderer to them. And, right, right, right. Uh, instead, like, in the, the modern generation, it's like, I am legend because they come up with a vaccine that cures everyone. Right, right. Yeah, I feel the, like the, kind of stole away, you know, what was going on. It, it does. The book is really about it's a matter of perception. If everyone is a vampire, but you're not, right? You're the man out. You're the other. You know, that's right. kind of what the book was. I thought, yeah, I thought it was a good take because, like, generally when I watch, like, uh, or I read like an old story, like uh, Frankenstein or whatever, it's like the monster is who I'm cheering for. Hmm. It's like the the monsters seem to have like more to him, and people just like people are just being, you know, malevolent to him because he's different than they are. Yeah, yeah. Which is almost like a weird twist of society. <laughs> I would say I I I generally root for the slasher in slasher films, but a lot of people have asked me about the summer I died and the con because it's, it's three books now, and I'm working on the fourth one right now. And I always tell people, I go, yeah, I always root for the slasher, except for Tommy in the Jason movies. Right. Yeah. I really felt like, oh, this could be the first sort of guy, you know, the first like actual like sort of hero to a slasher that kind of works as a character. They didn't do it that great. Kind of ran with that, a little, that idea a little bit when I was doing The Summer I Died and stuff. In terms of like, oh, what if we really did have a character that could be the hero to a slasher? You know, like it's never, it's not really done. Normally, we watch slasher movies to watch the slasher kill people. Well, I guess yeah. you could do it kind of like like Dexter or something like that, where it's like he, you know, somebody who's like, you know, being a slasher, being a serial killer, but he's doing to take out the bad guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. Although now the Dexter has been done, it's like you can't do medical horror. I mean, you right. could do medical horror, but not along the same angle as like Dexter. Yeah, Dexter was Dexter was um, the execution of the first several seasons of Dexter was really good. I bought I, after I watched season one, I went out and I bought the first novel from uh, well, what's his name, Jeff Linz, Lindsay, something like that. I forget now. Um, I don't know. I, I didn't even know it was a novelization. Is that good? Yeah, it's based on a series of novels. The TV okay. show on a series of novels i'm trying to look at my bookshelf because i have it over there it's like jeff Lindsay or something like that right. uh, it's, they're a little they're a little bit different they're not as like quirky and funny as the tv show okay. but um but it was cool i i think the tv show did what they should have done which was kind of like they they made it a little more interesting than the novel the novel's good i liked the novel but i think i liked the tv show more which is one of those rare situations where i think the movie was better than the book kind of a thing where they made Dexter a little more relatable? Was that what they did? Yeah, they made it a little more relatable, and they made it, um, like I said, it was a little more quirky. It was a little more just kind of fun to watch Dexter do his thing and then try to figure out how to get out of situations. The first novel in the series is almost primarily exactly like the first season, although they do change some major things with, I think, the brother they changed, but otherwise it's pretty close to the first season. No okay. Yeah, I, I thought the second and the fourth season were my absolute favorites, but like one, two, and four were good, really good. I didn't, uh, I didn't watch the the newer season that came out like a couple of years ago. Neither did I. <laughs> I heard great things. 
Yes, yeah, so everyone was like, nah, that's not good. I was like, I'll just skip it then, you know. I'll just go out. I didn't like the last season that I had seen prior, but up to that last season, I liked pretty much everything. Yeah, that's one of those shows, like, The Walking Dead, after a while, I just gave up on. Uh, like, you've been yeah. over everything good, and you may as well just stop. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't make it to the end of Walking Dead. I don't make it to the end of most things. <laughs> Well, I dipped it, out. It, it just kind of dragged on. It's like it's not like yeah. they had a compelling story from beginning to end. Yeah. You know, like I liked. I go ahead. I was gonna say I liked the comics. I thought were really good. I wish they had stuck closer to the comics. Well, that's another thing I gave up on. Yeah, the the comics. Like that's generally the problem I have with uh, film adaptions is they often lose a lot of the grit. You know, of the uh, of the source material. Like uh, yeah, you yeah. saw the movie American Psycho, which you know oh, now, yeah. now if you watch it or now when I watch it, I'm like that's not bad. But at the time, I liked the novel so much, I was like, mm. this is a, this is a travesty. Yeah, I thought the novel did a greater job of confusing the reader, necessarily confusing the reader at the end in the terms of like, was that real or was he kind of thinking that or like it 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 was easier to come to that conclusion. I felt the movie. Right movie was a little more complicated to get to that point where the viewer goes wait is this real or is he thinking this or you know so i i've that for sure that one i prefer the novel over but i did love the movie i mean christian bale did such a great job you know well i feel like yeah christian bale's an awesome actor but i feel like like in the novel like He's so tightly focused on himself, like playing Huey Lewis or like being super right. into like the business cards or or whatever, yeah. like all the like little technical details that they just kind of wash over in the movie. Yeah, I did. I did like how in the movie every there were those chapters just about the music, like they what it was the Huey Lewis one. And then there was like a is there a Whitney Houston chapter? I'm trying to I read it. Yeah, so there was Whitney Houston. And there was um a Genesis one where he's like talking right. about Phil Collins and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Those were such great chapters. Especially, you know, I, I used to make my living as a musician. So I was reading it around the time that I was starting to try to play professionally. And I loved those. What, what, what were you musician? Like, what did you do? Uh, what you know, instrument did you play? Or were you the singer? Uh, and I do drums, guitar, upright bass, and piano. Um, when I came out to San Diego, I was making a supplemental living as a guitarist in a rockabilly band. And we used to open for a Johnny Cash tribute band. And so when their upright bass player left the band, I said, hey, I'll do it. And I toured the country for whatever it was, about four years playing upright bass in a Johnny Cash tribute band. So that that was when I like quit my job and just played music solely that was all i did you know so which was cool and then we had a, a tour bus basically and i would sit in the back of the tour bus with my laptop and write books <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome so yeah. when was that like what what time span roughly uh well that was let's see so my son is nine ten about 11 i left the band about 11 years ago 10 11 years ago so when my wife was pregnant uh i was on tour a lot and I came home from tour after three weeks on the road or whatever. And we had a big German shepherd Rottweiler mix. <laughs> and she was like, well, you're gone all the time. Like need, you know, something. And that was when I kind of realized like, all right, I can't be on the road all the time with a, my wife's home pregnant and she's working. So it's like, she needed help, you know? And also I think after, after you're on the road for four years and you're just living out of hotels and driving a tour bus at 3 AM and sleeping in the bunks in the tour bus and, it's a grind, man. It's like it's like any vacation you take, getting getting to the airport or getting to the bus station or the train station. It's always a grind. It's cool when you get to the hotel and it's cool when you're on stage, but the rest of the time it's work. And you know, our big joke in the band was uh, you know, we were professional travelers with a music problem. And because <laughs> you know, you get two hours of like the two hours you're on stage, that's weirdly like your downtime, you know, like you're right, working. Right. I mean, you spent so least... long traveling there from like one location to the next location. Yeah. yeah. And our booking company, um, who was great, they would book us like eight to 10 hours apart. So if we were in, you know, whatever city we were in Tuesday night, the next city would be 10 hours away, you know? 
So we'd have to leave the next morning or even the next, even that night, sometimes we'd get off stage at 1 a.m., load up the tour bus, and we would drive till 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. until we got to the next town. And a lot of the time we had hotel, which was nice. So we could go up and sleep for a few hours, but sometimes we didn't and we would just sleep in the tour bus. And those bunks are small, you know? <laughs> yeah, uh, I know a lot of people that were, um, I have a lot of musicians and friends that, that, you know, they love playing live, but they can't stand all the. Eventually, they just have to get up because it's too much traveling. Like you don't yeah. see your wife or your girlfriend or yeah. your dog or you know anybody. Yeah, yeah it's uh, it was tough. Uh, you know, at the time I was in, we were engaged, and my wife's trying to plan the wedding, so she's I'm in wherever I am, Wichita or something. She's sending me pictures like, "What do you think of this venue?" And I'm like, "Uh." If it's good with you, I guess it's good with me, you know, so you miss out on a lot being on the road for that length of time. So I was I was sad to stop playing music professionally, but I was also very, very happy to finally be home, be able to spend time with the family. And then, of course, when my kids were born, it was like I, I can't imagine going on the road now having small children. So. So what did you if you're doing that for a living, what did you start doing for a living after that? Uh, so when I quit doing the music, it was primarily we, my wife and I kind of agreed that I would be the stay at home dad. So I, but at the time I was uh, running a company called Grandma Press, which is still kind of sort of around. Right. Uh, no, I've heard of them. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I, me and my business partner, Steve, who was my former boss when I lived in New York City, um, he came on sort of as the uh, the financial backing sort of guy. And I was sort of the face of the company. So I was staying home with my newborn baby at the time, but I was working, running that, that uh, publishing company doing that. And I did that for about, you know, we did, did that as a traditional publisher for probably four to five years. And then Steve's health started to get a little rough and my kids were getting older. So it wasn't as easy when you've got a newborn, you can kind of just like put them down on the rug or, nap time you know and you can get work done but when they're, like, when they're four or five it's like no nah, they're just running around and, you know it's, so um but thankfully around that time you know there was stuff like the movie deal was starting to happen and the books were getting noticed and i was lucky enough to be doing okay through that side of of writing you know um and and then prior to all of that uh, you know, like I said, I was working in New York City uh, at a nightclub, came out here and got a job at a magazine. And I worked there for almost eight years, just, you know, worked my way up from staff writer to the executive editor before I did the Johnny Cash thing. What was so, the magazine? Uh, it's, it's called Ranching Coast. It's still around here in Southern California. And it's a luxury lifestyle magazine, which is essentially like, you know, uh, it's you know, it's about the new Ferrari that just came out or like what's new in backyard pools with grottos. <laughs> what can you get for, you know, what, what kind of a backyard do you want for your $6.8 million home in the Hills? Um, it was that kind of stuff. I wrote, I always joke, but this is true. I wrote a lot of articles about like women's clothing and stuff. Uh, and I would write it under a, a fake name. So I would like do these reviews of like women's shoes and stuff or just stuff that I would never really uh buy myself, you know. I still would your like, girl give you a lot of feedback on that, like whether it was a good product or not. Um, I never really got any feedback one way or the other. I think the only time I got a couple angry emails about a couple things I had written, but they were, you know, that was pretty rare that that happened because it was the magazine's primarily just sort of like, hey, here's what's going on in Southern California um, <clears throat> as it relates to your home, your garden, your car, your travel plans. Hey, you want here's what's going on in Fiji this year, you know, and it's like right. for those it's for those people who can afford that kind of kind of stuff, you know. Um, but I still do uh technology articles for them today. So every okay. every couple they'll, they'll call me up and say, Hey, we need to do a gadget article, and I'll do that for them, which is nice. So is writing your main focus now? I I think so now. Yeah. It wasn't okay. it wasn't meant to be. I went to I got my degree in communication because I wanted to do something in movies. 
Um, and I interned, I was lucky enough to intern with David Mamet on a movie called The Spanish Prisoner, oh, yeah. which starred Steve Martin. Not a lot of people know of this movie. It's it's like a heist movie, kind of. It's like a serious movie, like a heist movie. It's got Steve Martin. Um, well, I know Steve Martin and Dave Mann, so, you know, probably people get a bit together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called The Spanish Prisoner. It's not, there's a new show out now called The Spanish Prisoner. That's not that one. But anyway, so I, I had wanted to do stuff in film, and I, that's why I went to New York City after that experience. And I worked on some, like, Coca-Cola commercials and stuff, just doing, like, grip work. And I wasn't thrilled with it. Um, and that's when I kind of had, I had a friend working at a nightclub in New York City at the time. And he was like, oh, we need someone to help out. We don't really have like a PR guy. And we have like one of the largest nightclubs in the city. We should have a PR guy. <clears throat> and so I went, excuse me, and I met the owner. And he's like a, he's like a bibliophile. Like he loves books. He collects books. He's got all these great first editions and everything. And so we just kind of started talking books because, you know, I've always been a reader. And he brought me on to basically write press releases for the club. And that's kind of where I got my start in my writing career was doing press releases for this big DJ centric, <clears throat> excuse me, nightclub in New York city. And um, from there, that's, you know, that's why I was able to get work at the magazine later on and stuff like that. When did you uh, transition more into uh, writing fiction? So when I was working at the magazine, this is a true story. Um, I so what I got like I was saying, I was writing articles on like women's shoes and handbags and stuff. And sometimes I didn't have anything to write because I was like the in-house staff writer versus being like you know an outside staff writer. Um, so if I wasn't working on something in the office to write on, and I wasn't, and there were no phone calls coming in, I would just start like, oh, I was going to write something on the computer. So I had started writing the summer I died in the office. <clears throat> it primarily started as like a writing exercise. Or, or more of like a, I don't know what the term would be, just something to kind of like get my head in the game for that day of like writing stuff. Okay. And uh, my boss found, I don't know, the first four or five chapters on the computer and she fired me. <laughs> <laughs> like you were doing that instead of like uh, whatever right. work you're supposed to be yep. doing. Yeah. Yeah. And she was totally in the right. She was totally in the right to fire me. She's like, what are you, what is, what are you doing? There? I'm not paying you to write fiction. You know, but, uh, you know, to her credit, she rehired me after I was like, I'm sorry, I won't do it anymore, blah, blah, blah. And when I when I sold that novel uh, to a small press publisher in Canada, she was actually gracious enough to like she looked over the contract for me and stuff like that. And yeah, so she she ended up being, you know, pretty cool in the end. Um in regards to that situation. But yeah, it's funny. You know, I got fired for the summer I died, which was kind of a funny story. <laughs> so is that like your, your like, uh, you think your biggest break as far as story so far? Or have you written other stuff? It's like, well, uh, that's, that's yeah. certainly my, my big one. Um, I, I, I wish the others would become as big as that you know i've written 15 novels i think two short story collections um they some of the other ones do okay some of them don't do much of anything um you know that's why i'm doing part four well, they might they might blow up like years after you die it, it might be it, like lovecraft or poe or something yeah like. i mean that'd be great i won't be around to experience it but like i guess so i'm i would I think in terms of, uh, like I said, I got one through. I'm happy with that. I think that's more than a lot of people will will get to do. You know, I a lot of people write and write and write and just maybe something doesn't stick ever. Or, that you know, maybe, they, uh, maybe they're not happy with the one that does stick or something like that. Um, so I'm pretty content with that whole situation. Um, but I am interested in continuing that character i love writing that character of all the characters i've written i think that one's the one that like feels closest to me so that's why i'm doing book four and i may do book five i may do book six we'll see do you keep sort of a continuity like even <clears throat> loosely, like Stephen king does where it's like you know one character is kind of the same universe as another character I have done a sort of, yeah, Stephen King, Tarantino thing where I will allude to characters from The Summer I Died. Hey man, 
Hey, you're back. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> this time the dog's off the cord. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't even know what I was talking about now. I freak. I freaked out. I'm like, oh no, what happened? I <laughs> terrible. Right in the middle of an interview, and then I'm looking at this little icon on my computer that's doing this. Like, it's a picture of a leaf over the battery. I've never even seen that, but I guess. But, I good. wonder where my dog chewed on the cords of my microphone. I'm like, all of a sudden, like, is my microphone, and my headphones are tied into the same thing? I was like, why can't I hear anything? Why does everything sound so muffled? <laughs> I was like, oh, because he, <laughs> you know, he chewed through it. Yeah. yeah. It's the worst. <laughs> I, I'm so I am so not a technology guy. I you know I I like technology, but like uh, it makes me crazy. I'm not good at it. So, right. Although <laughs> some of it gets a little bit uh, scary, like with the Elon Musk wanting to put the implant in your brain, and like yeah, all you yeah. think of is like Skynet. And, you know. Yep. Yeah, I don't. I waffle on that kind of a thing because on the one hand, I'm like. I don't need technology in my body. And then the other hand, it would be so nice just to be able to wave at my TV and have it come on instead of looking around for the remote. Like, where's the remote? Who lost the remote? You know, so. Yeah, I do that all the time. Yeah. All right. So getting back to your work. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't. Sorry. What were we talking about? <laughs> well, I, I was asking if you all keep in the same continuity. Oh, you right. The same yes. vibe. Do you have like um, different stories you want to tell? And you kind of like link them a little bit i mean that's what i do it's like you know okay i see yeah yeah yeah. i see what you're saying yeah so uh, i guess what i was saying is i i have little hints that maybe it all exists in the same universe but like I don't, i've never really thought long and hard about connecting it all it's really just i want to tell this story i want to tell this story i want to tell this story they don't have to be connected or in the same universe um i've had some readers email me and go oh when you mentioned this thing was that part of this book over here and i'm just like uh, maybe <laughs> Well, Probably. I think it's always if nice it works for you. Yeah, I think it's always nice when you tell a different story, and then there's like a little clue hidden in there somewhere. Yeah. Like that's like what Stephen King does all the time. There's just like a little clue. Yeah, they well, that, you and I, maybe that's kind of what I do a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. I do that. You know, I probably got it from Stephen King. Who knows? Uh, but I know Tarantino does it and stuff. Where you just throw in like the little like reference to a prior movie and it gets you going oh is this are these related somehow you know but i don't think i don't think that far ahead i just think oh it'd be cool to mention a character from this book in this book and but th that's it just just throw out the name nothing else you know <laughs> so the the story that you wrote for uh my anthology um is it kind of the vibe that you generally go for um did you kind of like alter the the way that you told that story um i did alter the way that i well i i try to sometimes write outside of my typical voice sometimes i'll try to challenge myself that was one where i was trying to kind of challenge myself um i don't i don't write a whole lot um i write a lot in first person because it comes easy to me so whenever i'm writing in third person it's a little bit more of a challenge um and so writing in third person with a character archetype that I've never written before is even more of a challenge. And then I don't typically do a whole lot of uh, Tales from the Crypt type stuff. You know, it, it's a lot of my readers want stuff a little more grounded in reality. At least that's what it feels like. They want stuff a little more grounded in reality. But I love, I love Tales from the Crypt kind of uh, creep show creatures. I, I just love that stuff so much. Um, I hadn't written one of those types of stories in a very long time. So it was really fun to write that story. And then to have it be based on such a personal thing that happened to me recently where I did break my hip and it was the most excruciating thing I've ever been through in my life, you know, and lying on the ground for 20 minutes as the ambulance came thinking, thank God there's people all around me because if I was just in the woods, I'd be dead, you know? Yeah. yeah. There's no, I couldn't even wiggle my toes without screaming. Like, I mean, I was literally screaming. You know, I think that personal reference helps a lot. Like, oh, like, yeah. I, like, I grew up in the South as like a punk rocker back in like the late 80s, early 90s. And mm -hmm. it was not easy on people like that. Plus, my dad's super military, super yeah. religious. So, you know, I, I try and bring some of the stuff that I, I went through and I felt 
you know, into the story because it feels more real to me. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of telling what actually happened. Yeah, the the whole, you know, it is true. You should write what you know if you know it. I guess. <laughs> I and I knew what the hell a broken hip felt like. Man, it was, it was the worst. It was, and I was like, well, I, you know, that that'd be fun to try and get that through in a character, and then to make the character kind of a, a little bit of a shithead a little bit. Yeah, a little bit of a douchebag. Yeah. <laughs> what I thought of is when I read about him, I thought about like because I've been doing a lot of horror conventions, especially recently, like author conventions, and you always get you get some people that are amazingly talented, and then some people just want to shock you. They want to throw out yeah. the stuff that like you know that drags you through the dirt and makes you feel kind of queasy. And yep. that's what it felt to me like that character was. It it was it was <laughs> it was me poking fun a little bit at myself because. I think the book, The Summer I Died, there is a lot of shock value in it, which I don't really do that stuff anymore. Um, so I'm guilty of doing it. So I was poking in front of myself a little bit, but then also recognizing, like you said, yeah, there are definitely authors out there that are just like, they just kind of write the gross stuff to be gross. And then they don't really add a whole lot of character depth to it. Right. You know, like I, I have no problem with gross stuff, which is fine. Um, but I want character as well, you know. So yeah, no, I, I like it, like a strong backstory. I like and, and one thing that I thought was like just a shock value film was a Serbian film. And I remember I was talking to Garrett Cook, and he was like, "Well, actually, you know, that's kind of based on like the way certain people were treated in Europe and all that." So mm -hmm. he brings all these elements into it. I'm like, I didn't know that, so that makes me look deeper into the film but i wish that they'd been a little bit more clear and like yeah. kind of the 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 lore and the history and everything that i was based off of because to me yeah I mean, like yeah it's just like an over the top like like I, I don't know if you've seen it but like at the end like i, I haven't it, i know what it is i know what yeah. it is but i haven't watched it you know it's it's one of those things i think because i have kids and i've heard about it and everything and i was like ah, maybe i'll skip that one you know yeah, i didn't think it was really a good movie like I, I was working at a shop and like all the tvs were linked and one of the guys uh -huh. there put it on so i i kind of had to see it while yeah. i was tattooing somebody you know and i was like you know well i, I wonder what this film is about I'm like this is not really a good film <laughs> yeah 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 that's the other thing with those is you you sometimes have to question. Okay, it's got great sh it's got great shock value and gore concepts and everything, but is the movie actually good? You know, like I've only seen the first Terrifier and it was fine. I didn't not like it. I didn't think it was like great. Uh, I thought the gore was great, you know, but I was kind of just like, man, all right, it was okay, you know. Um, well, I think people are getting away from the like. Uh building up a story like i, right. I really like, like i don't know if you read the the novel lucifer's hammer um no it, well the nice thing about that is like it it's a fairly long book but the first hundred pages nothing happens it's just building up characters and then this giant meteor slams into the earth and like everything turns apocalyptic overnight but now you know about the characters, so you're kind of invested in them. So when they start doing stuff, you feel more, you know, yeah, you feel deeply for them. Yeah, yeah, totally. I like building characters. That's one of the fa my favorite things to do as a writer is build character. It's it's tough. I think it's easier in novel form than in movie form because with movies you got to kind of hook your audience fast. Oh, yeah, novels, definitely, definitely. You gotta, you, with novels, you can take a little more time to build character. But even in today's society of like everyone's used to that rapid fire hook at the start of a movie. So even when you're writing, I think these days there's gotta be a little bit of like something that hooks them in. So it can get a little tricky to like try to build character, but also add hook in the beginning, which is something I, you know, hopefully I'm, I'm getting better at it. But uh, well, I noticed a lot of people, the way they dress it is they do a little bit of backstory. Then they do the boom in your face and then they go back in time. They like, they, they mm. build up the story so you know what yeah. led to that like shocking event yeah yeah and that's um i've done that it's it's a technique that works uh it's you know it's effective if it's done properly because i have definitely watched movies where it hooked me in that first minute with something and then it cuts back to the build-up and i think to myself well if it had just started with the build-up i probably would have dipped out 
you know. Right. <laughs> so I'm glad they I'm glad they threw the hook in the beginning, you know. But then I also, you know, I really appreciate a movie like The Witch or however you say it, the two V's or whatever, The Witch, uh, which just a slow, that slow, 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 slow build up until you hit you hit a certain point in the movie, like three quarters of the way through where it just kicks into high gear and you're like, oh, it was totally worth it to watch that really slow build up. But but it was character development, which was good. You no, know, I know a lot of people complain about that, but the ones that seem to hold up over time have that build up, like like Blade Runner and stuff like that. Yeah. Where like you see a little bit more of the world develop, and then when it gets crazy, you know, it, it's more impactful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love Runner is probably my favorite film of all time, by the way. So, well, my favorite film of all time is the shirt you're wearing, The Shining. Oh, nice! Man, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, you know it's no, like I really enjoyed the movie The Shining, and I knew that Stephen King is not happy with it, but okay. I don't look at it as like Stephen King Shining. I look at it as like Stanley Kubrick's interpretation of The Shining, and he's yeah. so good that when he interprets it, you know, it it is very impactful. It it has yeah, a yeah. lot of worth to it. You know, not everyone's yeah. like that, obviously, but like Stanley Kubrick, I think, is a master filmmaker. Oh, he's fantastic. I, I like the Shining movie equally as much as I like the Shining book. That's one of those ones where I'm torn. Like, I don't think one is better than the other. I think they're both, they're, they're each a separate uh, identity of the same story. And they both work equally as well. Right. When they Versus when they tried to do the, uh, was it the Rob Lowe version? Which, oh no. Um, is it Rob? No, it was the guy from Wings. I forget his name. Uh, is that the TV version? Yeah, the TV version. Yeah, I heard that was horrible. I've never even watched it because I, I love the movie so much. I wanted to run. Yeah, it's, you don't need, it's not, that's what I was saying. It's it's not, they were more faithful to the book, but it's not as good a movie. The Kubrick yeah. version is way better, even though it's not as faithful to the book. So Right. No, it's his interpretation. You can't take a longer book and shorten it into a movie and be exactly, you know, you know precisely faithful to the source material. Yeah, like I, I feel like as long as you do a good job of it, right? That, that's probably like that. That's probably more what's called for, like uh, yeah, yeah. And I think sometimes when people interpret it into a movie, like I really enjoyed Paul Verhoeven's uh version of Starship Troopers, and like you mm. see the movie, like he injected a lot of like kind of like a tongue cheek social commentary to the movie that's not there in the book. And yeah, I I appreciate that he did that. Yeah, yeah. I love that movie. I, I put it on for my son like two years ago, so he was like seven. And I was like, oh, and I had forgotten how gory it is. And we put it on and we were just watching it. And at a certain point, I forget, some guy's skull gets caved in or something. And I was like, all right, maybe we'll skip this one. It was the second the guy's brains out. With like yeah, that. I think that was it. It was like <laughs> the boss gets through the skull. And I was like, maybe we'll revisit this. You know, and my my kids are like really good with horror. Um, you know, growing up with me, and my wife's a huge horror fan. <laughs> and so my son's been watching horror movies for a while because the what I did early on, because he sees that we like horror. He's like, oh, I want to watch this, I want to watch Jaws, I want to watch Freddy. And I go, Well, you can't watch it till you watch behind the scenes documentary first. So this is how <laughs> my house is you want to watch Jaws, you gotta watch behind the scenes documentary first. So you see that it's all fake. And you understand how they did the gore effects. And so I just showed my uh, my daughter, who's five and a half. She, I finally showed her Jaws the other day. And she fell asleep. <laughs> she, <laughs> she, she, she made it. Yeah, she made it halfway through and she was like, oh. <laughs> so. Well, I think sometimes that making up ruins it. Like I saw the making of 300 right before I mm -hmm. saw the movie 300. And it's all green screen. So when, yeah, I, yeah. when I saw the making of it and then I saw it, it was like, it's not nearly as impactful because I, I know where everything is. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've said that to my kids too. I go, look, I don't want to ruin movie magic for you. You know, right. I because when I grew up watching Jaws, probably around eight or nine, I thought that shark was real, man. Like, I <laughs> was in my backyard. Um. So I don't want to ruin movie magic for them, but I also do, I don't want them having nightmares every night as well. So you know how much beach traffic that ruined? <laughs> like how many places like suddenly had nobody showing up? Right. Yeah. 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 
I think when my son, you know, he's going to be 10 soon. Uh, I think when he hits 10, I'll probably, he doesn't really need the behind the scenes stuff anymore. He gets it. He's like, yeah, I know it's fake dad. We were watching Ash versus evil dead the other night on TV. And I just looked at him like, he's like, yeah, I know dad. I know it's all fake. My, my daughter, she's younger. So for her, I'll still do some behind the scenes stuff a little bit for now, but at a certain point, yeah, you got to cut them off because I don't want to know that it's a green screen. I went and saw, I took my son to see the Indiana Jones movie, which was pretty good. I liked it enough, but oh, the new one. Yeah. The next day I got home and I was on social media and somebody had posted some picture of something like you're saying, like it was a green screen situation or something. And I was like, Oh man, I thought that was real. <laughs> it kind of like bummed me out, you know? Wait, I mean, I, I heard very mixed reviews, but it's hard for me to judge anything. until I actually see it in person. Yeah. I, I, I liked it. And I think I liked it because I hated crystal skull. <laughs> I, I, I like that. You know they still use that term nuke the fridge for when you fuck something yeah. up. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. They definitely nuke to the fridge. Three, uh, two, it was so one, I could just, my friends were asking me, is it good? Is it good? And I, I just kept saying, you know what? It's better than part four. So <laughs> take that for however you want. <laughs> what well, is it as good as the first one? No, it's not as good. The first three will always be fantastic movies. First one's always going to be, to me, the, the greatest. The, the second one, I don't know if you rewatched it recently. Like when I saw it as a kid, it, it scared the fuck out of me. Like, yeah, it's terrifying. Out. You know, yeah, when I saw it recently, it's terrifying. You know, I was just like, well, it's kind of campy, kind of over the top. I was like, yeah, but I enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the first, I like them kind of in the order they came out Raiders, then Temple, then Last Crusade. And then Crystal Skull, I was just like, I was ready to walk out of the theater. I'm like, what did they do? What? <laughs> Terrible. So I was happy to at least sit through Dial of Destiny and think, okay, it's not that bad. It's not the greatest Indiana Jones movie by a long shot, but it's light years better than Crystal Skull. So right, right. I, I know people were saying a lot of stuff about like uh, you know, Harrison Ford is old and they call it the Dial of Dysentery and you know <laughs> all sorts of stuff. But again, I have to see it before I can judge it. Mm. But all right, so. I don't want to keep you here all night, so let, let's talk about what you have out, what people can buy, how they can see what's going on. Sure, sure. Um, I I was trying to grab like uh, some books off my shelf right before. So this is out, right? <laughs> That's the most amazing one right there. <laughs> Never Dead is out. Grab this. I lo- By the way, the artwork that you did is amazing. I'm going to get that one frame that you sent me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I don't know if are you putting the video up for this. Should I show people a teaser of the artwork? That's just a teaser. Boom. Um, yeah. To find out why that guy's in the story. <laughs> that's a that's a great anthology. Thank you for thinking of me for that. Um, this was the last one I had come out. This is my short story collection that came out a little while ago. No um, It's called Hitching Rides in the Darkness. If, is, if you want to tell me the name of stuff, and I'll put it up so people can see it like nice and clear. Yeah, yeah. So this is Hitching. This was my short story collection, Hitching Rides in the Darkness. I've got a couple collections, but this is this just came out like three or four months ago. Uh, this is the you know this is my my money maker here. The summer I died. Um, that's the bit. So and then that's part of the Roger Huntington saga. Excuse me. Which there's three books of right now. I'm working on the fourth. I would say also, please check out the Hissers trilogy. Uh, Hissers 1, Hissers 2, and then Hissers 3, which I co-wrote with my buddy Anthony Trevino. Uh, he helped me. He really uh, saved me on this when he came in and helped me finish that book because I was just in, I was in a spot in my life where I was like, I don't think I'm ever going to get this trilogy finished. And he was like, you got to finish it so that you can do more Roger Huntington books. So he came in and helped me get that done. So the Hissers trilogy is out there. I don't know. I mean, I I usually just tell people, go to my website, ryancthomas.com. I've got all the books listed there. I've got some free stuff up there for people if they want it. Is uh, it all available on Amazon or it's all, Nobles? It's all, yep. Uh, I'd say 90, I'd say it's all available on amazon.com for sure. Uh, ebook, paperback, most of it's in audio at this point. I think there are still a few that are available on on wider platforms or 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 
other platforms I should say like Barnes and Noble and <clears throat> Word. Uh, I forget what the that other one was called. Anyway, Amazon's like the big one. Yeah, every I think everything's on Amazon. You have a uh, Smash Words is one. Um, oh, Smash Words. That's what I was yeah. trying to think of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so that kind of because I know some people. There's some you know people out there who don't like Amazon, and I totally right. get it. So there, my stuff is floating around on other. It, it's so convenient. You order it in your fucking house. You know. I know. I know. I I hate. I hate to admit how much I use Amazon because I get it. I get the hate for it, but like it's so convenient. Right. So when you know, with kids and dogs, and it's like I need this thing now, and they'll be. It's like it'll be, it'll be there tomorrow, and I'm like, yeah, great. Right. Like so, I need a dog leash. We'll be here in two days. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Totally, totally. So, and then, and then, yeah, and then, uh, I think that's it, really. Like I said, um, you have a author's page on Amazon. I do. I don't really, I don't really go to it that much. But probably uh, all your books are linked on there, right? Yeah, they are all linked. I spend most of my time on Instagram. Uh, so my, and you know, the, my, uh, my page is Ryan C. Thomas Books, right? I think. Yeah. <laughs> But I I believe so. I've tagged you. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I spend most of my time there and I keep that one just sort of uh public. Anyone can hit me up on that. Um so that's sort of like my public social media. If anyone wants to send me a message or call me a bad name, whatever they want to do, it's fine. <laughs> are you on a Twitter? Well, no, it's X, you know, but are you uh, on, yeah, on no. X or Facebook? Um, Grandma Press was is on Twitter, but I haven't been on it in so long. I just didn't like the way the direction it stopped being fun. It just wasn't fun anymore. Um, so that's why I primarily stay on Instagram. I am on Facebook. I don't use it too much. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I'm on. I don't do a whole lot of social media these days. I probably should do more, you know, especially with what we were talking about earlier with the marketing aspect of being a writer these days you but could, uh wear bikinis and go on tiktok you know i know <laughs> well i just found out about book talk like maybe two weeks ago i never even heard of this thing I, i've never heard of it yeah oh well we'll have to look up book talk i still <laughs> i don't know if it's like just like a hashtag or if it's like a community or if it's like an actual person's pay i don't know i just know that like uh a lot of people are kind of blowing up on on book. So if your book makes it big on book talk, you know, right? It it, it sells copies. So I don't know. I guess it's the new book bub or whatever. Yeah, that... I heard book bub is not that great anymore. And you know, yeah. At one point, everyone was trying to get on book bub, and so yeah. you're you're like, I I just fucking write and do other stuff. I didn't know. I don't pay attention to all the social media stuff. But... Me neither, man. I have no idea. I'm too old. I think it's not that shit. <laughs> I don't know what the kids are talking about, you know. Um, I just hope they still want to read some horror and will buy some books. Right. And uh and hopefully so. all the way comes calling again and like they pick up some stuff and do some of that like Hellboy Mike Nola money so that you know they're like, yeah. now I'm sitting comfortably. Yeah, yeah. Totally. I, I'm I'm a I'm a big Hellboy fan. Yeah. I like comics. Uh, do you what, you read a lot of comics or? Yeah, yeah. I, I originally wanted to be a comic artist, and uh, like I didn't know if I wanted to do art or writing. And then I read some stuff like uh, Watchmen and Dark Knight and stuff like that. They're more mm -hmm. like you know they're literally advanced, and then also the art was great. And so I was like, oh, I can yeah, do yeah. both. You know, so when I went to art school, I was thinking this is what I'm going to do. And then I moved to New York City, and then it was like DC Comics and Marvel Comics, the Image Comics, mm -hmm. and pretty much if you're a nobody, they just want you to do their stuff. And you know, maybe yeah. I'm just too stubborn or whatever. But I'm like, I'll do illustrated books. But yeah, I, I do yeah. read a lot of comics. Yeah, yeah, I I, I still I do uh, reviews for comics even today. They just sent me a package today, and I'm. I'm very behind. <laughs> I've got like two weeks worth of comics I'm supposed to go review on my Instagram page. Uh, so I'm still reading probably a few comics a night. But uh, yeah, I I have wish you, I could draw. Have you read I, Joe I, Hill's I uh, Lock and Key? Yeah. Oh, I love Lock and Key. Yeah. Lock and 
Great. Yeah, Lock and Key was one of my favorites. I think Preacher's probably my all-time favorite. Oh, I love Preacher, yeah. They yeah, did not great. do it justice in the TV show at all. No, I dipped out after season one. I was like, what is this? This is not... You didn't, you didn't miss much. You didn't miss much. Yeah, I couldn't do... I was like, no, I want I want the comic version. Right, so, right. so good. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, oh, uh, Lock and Key is a, another fantastic comic that I love. And I, oh, that's what I was going to say is I think I would have preferred to do comics versus books, but I, I can't draw for shit. So <laughs> I was like, I guess well, I'm people, on my own. People like Alan Moore decided that. It, and I love Alan Moore's writing. I've, I've done like, you know, six hour seminars or writing from him. But what he does is like he meticulously writes everything down and does like little cartoon storyboards. He's like, I know these are crap, mm -hmm. but like an artist can look and see where I'm going, and then they can yeah. you know do something much more well developed based off of that. So, so yeah, you yeah. can't you can't do it. I, yeah, I get what you're saying. I just I wish I could do it like you being an artist and a writer. That that's what I wish I could do, you know. But I, I I'm at I'm at the whim. Of, I did do one comic a couple years ago with a local guy here. Uh, who fantastic artist. Uh, it's called uh, Horgasm, which people can grab on Comixology. They did do hard copies of it, but I believe they're all sold out. Uh, but it's still on Horgasm. And I, I I was thrilled to finally have like a comic out because that's like my first love. You know, like the character in my most popular book, he's a comic book guy. It's what he wants to be is a comic book artist because it's me. It's, it's kind of like me. It's like, I want to be a comic book artist, but I can't draw. So... Do you do a lot of like, um, I, you know, and I, I've seen a lot of your tattoo artwork, which I think is phenomenal. Um, and I know, I, I think I saw when you did the other day that was a superhero one. Was it Spider-Man or what was? Oh, yeah, I'm doing mm -hmm. Spider-Man with the whole like Manhattan scene, you know. Yeah, yeah. And everything, yeah. Yeah, that was cool. Do you do a lot of superhero uh, tattoo art or? Well, fortunately, I own my own shop now. So, I, you know, and I had... Like, people sometimes have their, like, 15 minutes of fame, you know, where they're, like, in all the magazines, and they go all over Europe and stuff, and I did that. So, I have people that come to me for stuff, and because I have a little bit of freedom with owning my shop, I get to pick and choose what I do. So, I do a lot mm -hmm. of, uh, not necessarily just superheroes, but stuff that I find interesting. Like, I've done several Star Wars sleeves, and I did, like, nice. like uh, you know, like uh, Universal Monsters, I've done a few times. Did a whole like uh, yeah. you know, piss the hell back piece, you know. So just yeah, uh, yeah. I, I get to do stuff that I enjoy. Nice. The, the the one you did for the cover is this. Did you just come up with this on your own, or is this something that? Yeah, during uh, right COVID, during COVID lockdowns, you know, I was like, I just felt like you know doing something. So I was doing some private commissions. I was like. I'm going to do another Lovecraft piece. And I'm, I'm a huge Lovecraft fan. I'm like, I'll do another Lovecraft piece. And so I did that. And then, you know, when I kind of came up with the idea for the anthology, I was like, this would make a perfect cover. So I, I did mm -hmm. a little bit more like, you know, cleaning up so it works for a cover. And then I went with that. But it, it wasn't originally done for that. But I'm glad I got to use it for that. Yeah, it's cool. I, I think I remember you, because I've been following you for a little bit on uh, Facebook. And I remember you was this a back piece on somebody or no, there's another uh diver Cthulhu piece I did. Oh, okay. Um, and so I did oil painting of that and I did that as a back piece. Somebody asked for me to do that as a back piece, so I did that as a oh. back piece on Okay, cool. Yeah, no, very cool. I love the cool I'm a big Lovecraft fan as well. I was just showing about well, it's been a little while, but not too long ago I was showing my wife the uh Dagon movie that uh Stuart uh yeah Stuart Gordon yeah Stuart Gordon did yeah, yeah. she he had also, never seen he, that was like the third he did a Lovecraft trilogy yeah he, he did from beyond he did uh right the animator, the animator. Uh, yeah yeah but, uh, that was I thought that was his weakest although I mean he'll tell you that because he had no budget for it. for some reason they kind of cut the budget so he had to like go to Italy to film it yeah, but uh, I I still love it. I still think it's so creepy. Just the, the way he was able to pull off the practical effects of like the fish people and stuff. And, right. 
It has no budget. Yeah. 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 It's great. I think that's you know those like those three that you just mentioned are such good good films. Did you have a chance? I don't know if we're off topic here or not, but did you have a chance to read the uh, Providence comic that Alan Moore did a few years ago? I I read one of his. Um, I don't remember if it was because he did more than one, and he did one where it was, it was like, like nine issues long or something. It was like uh, it involved like a lot of like sex and you know transition between creatures. Oh, and all sorts of stuff. no, that was uh, I know what you're talking about. That was a different one. The Providence one was. Very, it was almost a, the whole thing was almost about Lovecraft going to New England, stumbling across the the whole Cthulhu cult kind of a thing. It's a oh, lot. Wow. Is it really good? Yeah, I really liked it. It was nine issues long. It was very, it was a lot of reading and it was, a, it started out pretty slow, but it, it really was like a love letter to fans of Lovecraft. Well, so I'm a big Alan Moore fan and I have a bunch of his work. All the way up until he started top ten, which is comic you know company, and mm-hmm. some of that kind of I felt like it kind of went off the rails, you know. And and then I read, I was like, oh, he did Lovecraft, this is gonna be awesome. And I read that, and I was like, all right, I give up. But I'll, <laughs> I'll definitely, I'll definitely check out Providence. Yeah, check it out. It's a it's a slow burn, you know. It's one of those like <laughs> quote unquote slow burns, but I liked it. I thought it was good. I'm from Rhode Island. That's where I grew up. So yeah, you know, okay. Lovecraft is like a, you know, it's a big thing for us. <laughs> right. Well, I, I do the Necronomicon. Like, uh, every other year is the author one. Like, you know, one year is like the, the movie one, and one year is like the author and art one. I always go to the author and art one. Oh, nice. Nice. That's cool. Yeah. But, all right, oh. man. Well, thank you very much for doing this. I, I yeah. know we had some technical problems, but, uh, you know. <laughs> it's, it's all good, man. Uh, I'll work it all out in editing. And, uh, yeah, just make it funny. Just be like, uh, what's wrong with this guy's? <laughs> Whatever. But, no, I, I definitely appreciate it. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll, I'll let you know when this is up. All right, man. Thanks. And thanks again for including me in the book, man. Yeah, all- no problem. Thank you for thank you. for. Uh, you put one of the one of my favorite sewers in there, so. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. Thank you. All right. Well, thank <laughs> you. I'll talk to you later.